I want to welcome everyone today. Uh, So good to be in God's house together. Also want to say a big hello to all those joining us online, along with all the men and women joining us in our correctional ministry, wherever you're at. We love you. So come on, come on, D-Town. Have me welcome our church family today. Come on, let them know. It's awesome. Well, Today we are in our third and final week of this series we've been doing called Healthy Rhythms. And kind of the the big idea and the purpose behind this series is that when life gets out of sync, we need some healthy rhythms to help, help us get back on beat. And so this series has been super practical, and my whole goal is to try and equip us uh, with some practical, healthy rhythms that we can instantly apply to our lives and see results right away. And I don't know about you, but I've needed this series maybe even more than you guys. In week number one, we talked about just slowing down. Anybody else need to hear that besides me? Let me just slow down. And then my week after I preached the message on slowing down, it got got even faster and just uh, reinforced the idea that I need to take a breath. And then last week we talked about how there's four primary uh, areas of our lives where we can just be running on empty, running on fumes and just feeling drained in. And we covered two of those areas last week. And that is we can just be emotionally and physically drained and on fumes. And so last week we talked about getting our strength Back. And today we're going to cover the other two areas uh, that we might be drained and running on fumes in, and that is in our time and in our finances. Everybody say finances. Everybody say time. We'll cover those two topics today, but I'll never forget when I got my first vehicle, the very first vehicle I ever owned. It was a 1996 teal green Buick Regal. Come on, somebody. It had leather, gray leather seats. This thing even came with a chrome luggage rack. Come on. I mean, when I would drive down the road, if you were over the age of 65, you were gawking at me. You were double taken. You were jealous of the Buick Regal that I was rolling in. This thing floated down the road. I mean, it put the L in luxury. And I'll never forget going to pick this car up. It was actually my grandparents' vehicle, uh, the same grandparents that prayed me in to the kingdom and had such a huge impact upon my life. And uh, unfortunately, they passed away. Uh, and, and so about six months after they passed, I was able to purchase the vehicle. And so it meant a lot to me uh, just because of the people who had owned it. And, and so I remember going to pick it up and putting the key in the ignition and starting that bad boy up. Man, that thing purred like a kitten. And I remember pulling it out of storage and I was so excited. And so I started driving down the road and instantly I knew something was wrong. Instantly, I knew there was a problem. Every time I put my foot on the gas and tried to accelerate, it was something like restricting it or holding it back. Now, I I don't know much about vehicles. I grew up playing a lot of sports, but I didn't do much when it came to vehicles or cars. And so I'm kind of clueless. And so I'm thinking, well, clearly something is wrong. Is it the fuel pump? Is it the motor? Is it the engine? I'm not sure. Let me just keep pushing even farther down on the gas pedal. Maybe that will help things out. And so I'm driving down the road, and then it's time for me to get on the highway because I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. And so I get onto the highway, and I can't go more than 40 miles an hour. Cars are passing me. They think I'm a grandma in the wrong lane. And so, but I'm not, and I'm trying to push on the accelerator. And all of a sudden, I start to smell like this, this smell of smoke starts to fill the air. And at that point, I think to myself, maybe I should pull over. And so I pulled this side of the road, and I called a friend of mine uh, who is much more knowledgeable when it came to vehicles, and he showed up on the scene. And within five minutes, people, he had diagnosed the problem. I mean, this guy was good. And he came up to me and says, I got some good news, and I got some bad news. I said, well, give me the good news first. He says, the good news is there's nothing wrong with your vehicle. I said, that's not good news. That's great news. I go, what's the bad news? He said, the bad news is you've been driving with the emergency brake on. (laughs) Come on, tell me I'm not the only one who's ever done this. Who else has done this? Sir, I see you. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, this thing was like a pedal up on the left, top left corner. You would push in. It was stuck. It was black. Like you couldn't see underneath there. And, and you had to push on it to release it. I mean, who knew? Who knew there was the e-brake on the whole time? I, mean, I was driving down the road with the emergency brake on, and I didn't 
even know it. And to your surprise, I'm sure, as soon as I took the emergency brake off, man, that thing floated <laughs> down the road. It was amazing. And, and uh, uh, here, here's, here's the point. Uh, I, I was driving down the road with the emergency brake on, and it was limiting my ability to drive down the road. And in the same way, I think there are some areas in our lives, we're driving with the emergency brake on that are limiting our ability to drive down this road called life, specifically in the areas of our finances and our time. And so as we talk about healthy rhythms, the title of the message today is Unlocking Your Limitations. Come on, unlocking your limitations. And we're going to get our rhythm back today. And I want to start things off by taking a look at probably the most uh, well-known uh, chapter in the entire Bible. It's probably the famous, most famous chapter in the Bible. We know the, the most famous <clears throat> excuse me, verse is John chapter uh, 3, verse 16. But the most famous chapter has to be Psalms 23. And so let's take a look. At the first two verses, Psalm 23, David's speaking here, and he says, The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my guide. The Lord is the one who leads me, right? He guides me. Sometimes I just need to be reminded of that. Wait a minute. Let me just remind myself of who's in control. God is in control. He is my shepherd. It goes on to say, I have all that I need. He lets me rest. In green meadows, he leads me beside peaceful streams. I love those two sentences. I have all that I need. He lets me rest. How many of us know that God has a rhythm for every single area of our lives? And as we talk about finances and time today, I want to kind of take a look at them, these two areas from a different angle, maybe a different perspective. And so we're changing it from finances and time to prosperity and productivity. Come on, who doesn't want to be more prosperous and more productive? So let's start with taking a look at some healthy uh, rhythms when it comes to prosperity. I just want you to know that uh, today's going to be super practical, kind of more of a, a teaching than, uh, than uh, a preachy. There might be some times you could say, preach to that white boy, but it's going to be really heavy, heavy informational. I really, my whole goal is to equip you and equip myself as well. And so, <clears throat> We'll start off by taking a look at some healthy rhythms of prosperity. And, and I know the word prosperity is, is somewhat frowned upon in, in churches today because of the whole prosperity gospel movement that took place uh, shortly after World War II back in the 1950s that, that said if you're a follower of Jesus, you're not going to experience any earthly suffering. Uh, it's always going to go well for you if you're a Christian, that if you're following God, he's going to give you a good life where you're going to be safe and you're going to be comfortable. And the only problem with that belief is that's not what the Bible says at all. In fact, if you've been sucking air for any amount of time, then you've, I got your attention with that, didn't I? Then you've discovered what I have, and that is there are moments and times where life can just kick you in the teeth. In fact, the Bible tells us that we're in a spiritual battle as Christians, that we're in this invisible war. Well, how many of us know that there's ca- people get hurt in war? There's casualties and hardships in war. In fact, Jesus even gave us this promise. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. But he goes on to say, but take heart, church, because I have overcome the world. And so we don't have to shy away from prosperity because actually the Bible still talks a lot about prosperity, that God wants his kids to be prosperous. It just doesn't mean that we're never going to face any trials or hardships or difficulties in our lives. And so take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. I love this passage of scripture. It starts off by saying, remember the Lord your God. If you've forgotten him today or you've gotten your eyes off it, just remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful. Other versions say he is the one who gives you the power to be wealthy, to be prosperous, Remember where your resources come from. Remember the Lord. He's the one that gives you the power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. What was that oath? That his kids would be prosperous, that they would eventually live in the land of flowing with milk and honey. He wanted his kids to thrive. He wanted his kids to be successful. He wanted his kids to prosper in their own land. So how many of us know that that, uh, prosperity doesn't just involve money, but how many of us know, but prosperity does involve money. So I want to give us 
three healthy rhythms when it comes to prosperity. If you're taking notes, and I know that you are because we know here at Experience Church, we are three times more likely to remember the information if we write it down. And so as you're writing this down, the first healthy rhythm of prosperity is number one, and that is to have a godly perspective. Come on, when it comes to finances, when it comes to prosperity, this is the starting place that we need to have God's perspective towards our finances. And you know how God sees prosperity? Through the lens or through the eyes of generosity. Everybody say generosity. Let me show it to us in Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. Paul speaking here and he says, you, church, you will be enriched in every, every way. You will be prosperous in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. In other words, God says, I want you to prosper. I want to bless you, but it's so that you can be a blessing. It's not so that you can just be have everything that you want and ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after. And so I want to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the world around you. And as you bless others and you're generous on every occasion, people wouldn't exalt you. People wouldn't put you on a pedestal. They would see me through your generosity and they would thank God for his goodness in their lives. This is the perspective and the point of prosperity. God says, I want to bless you so that you can be a blessing. It's really the difference, this perspective of a closed fist and an open hand. Dave Ramsey teaches this, and he says, when we view our finances and our resources with this closed fist, meaning I got to hold on to everything I have, and I got to keep a close grip of it, and, and I can't let any get away. And he says, that's true. I'm holding on to what I have, but how many of us know it doesn't allow God to give me more? But if I hold on to my finances, my resources with an open hand, yes, some might get away, but it allows God to pour more of it into my life. And when I have his perspective and realize that, that pro true prosperity is understanding God's called me to be generous to the world around me. And if I'm faithful with little, there's a little scripture that says, if you're faithful with little, you can be faithful with much. God says, if I can trust you with a little, I'll trust you with much, with more. But here's the problem that I've ran into when it comes to generosity. Like whenever I have a thought to be generous towards someone, like maybe I should pay for their meal at Chipotle because that's what Jesus would do. Or should I help somebody who's in need, they have a problem or, or just a, a need that they have and I can help meet that. As soon as I have this thought, all of a sudden following that good thought of generosity is followed by five thoughts of how maybe, well, I don't, I don't really have a lot to myself. I mean, if I give them that, if I buy that, that big old massive burrito from Chipotle and they get the guacamole, that's really going to, I'm not going to have a lot of money left over. And if I had more, maybe I'd be more generous, God. Anybody else get into this kind of like just debate with God when he's called us to be generous? And maybe next time I'll do it, God, not this time, but next time you tell me to be generous, I'll step out and do that. Or, or maybe this thought, this prompting is not from God. Maybe it's from the devil. Maybe the devil's trying to get me to buy that burrito. They don't need that burrito, right? <laughs> they need a, a, a bowl, a salad, more lettuce, right? So that's not the Lord. They're physically drained. We talked about that last week. I'm helping them. Right, Lord? Anybody else? I've said some crazy, maybe not that crazy, but I've said some stupid things. I've talked myself out of being generous so many times, right? But God's going, no, 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 see, if you look at prosperity through my lens and get my perspective, I actually see it through the lens of generosity. God wants us to prosper so that we can be generous to the world around us. God wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing. The second rhythm that I want to give to us today uh, when it comes to this area of prosperity in our finances, number two, write this down, and that is to value people over possessions. How many of us know we live in a day where we value things more than we value people? And if we want to walk in the rhythm of God's prosperity, we need to value what God values. And how many of us know God really values people? In fact, let me show us a little, scripture, a little passage of Scripture where, where Jesus is having this conversation. It's found in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 13. It says, Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. 
So here these brothers are in this argument. There's, these brothers are in this dispute. They're arguing over their inheritance. And Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge? He didn't respond like that. That's how I read it. Who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then Jesus said to them, watch out. You're, you're arguing about this. You're so concerned with that. Watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. You're so focused on possessions and material things, but life does not consist in abundance of possessions. I want to ask us a question today, and that is, what makes our lives rich? I would suggest that it's the people in our lives. It's not the possessions that we have. That true riches are our relationships, and God cares more about people than he does possessions, and we should too. We care about the people around us. And then the, the third kind of healthy rhythm when it comes to prosperity, and that is simply this, number three, and that is to live below your means. This is, this is a new teaching that just came out today. Living below, some of you have never heard this, this theory before, but we're gonna put it into practice and see it may, may become a reality in your lives. But this, this simply means that our expenses are less than our income that we're not spending more money than we make. And so let's just get real, real practical when it comes to our finances and resources because uh, statistics show us that three out of five Americans spend more money than they make every single month. How many of us know that's driving with the emergency brake on, especially when it comes to our finances and our money? I mean, this, this lifestyle leads to more and more credit card debt, which only leads to more and more stress in our lives, and it puts us out of God's rhythm when it comes to prosperity. In fact, the average American has $16,000 of credit card debt, and they're ending up paying huge interest rates to credit card companies. Come on, we're driving with the emergency brake. You laughed at me for driving with the emergency brake on. I'm not laughing at you. I'm just telling you, that is driving with the emergency brake on. It's the opposite of living below our means. That's living beyond our means. How many know that's not sustainable? And so how we compensate uh, too often the wrong way is we end up, because we're spending more money than we're making, we end up pick, picking up extra shifts at work. Or we end up taking on a second job. This is what my dad did. He's a hard worker, but he couldn't afford the lifestyle we were living, and so he's picking up extra shifts, another job. He was working 80 hours a week. I didn't see my dad for the longest time, and I knew I appreciated how hard he worked, but maybe we could just take a step back in our lifestyle, and I could get my dad back, right? And so I'm not against extra shifts and all that. Hear me. What I'm saying is I'm against the lifestyle that's leading us to do those things. I'd love to pick up some extra shifts just because I want to, well, I've got some extra cash, and there's some opportunity not to try and... Uh, fix or hold this lifestyle that's not sustainable. Are you with me, church? I mean, and by the way, earning more money doesn't automatically make us a better manager of our money either, just so we know. Because statistically, uh, we see that 57% of Americans have less than $1,000 in their savings account. I was, I was, I was staggering. 57, ha over half this room has less than $1,000 in our savings account. Well, here's the problem with that, because life happens. Things break. Things need replaced. And if we don't have the, the resources to be able to do it, all of a sudden it throws us into this tailspin when it comes to our, our finances. And you know what the first thing to go out the window when our finances get tight? Generosity. Because no longer can I even think about being a blessing to somebody else. I'm just trying to keep my own head above water. I'm just trying to pay these bills and pay off this credit card. How could I even be generous and have God's perspective, I'm just trying to make it another week till I get paid the next day. I know this is not God's plan for prosperity. We have to live below our means. And so, so what do we do? I'm so glad you asked, church. Um, I would suggest that we would live on a... <laughs> right? We live on a budget. I know some of you think I just cussed right there, but I didn't. We live on a budget. In fact, 61% of Americans say they don't have a budget. Can I just be your pastor for a second? If that's you today, that's foolish and unwise. 
How in the world can we steward what God has entrusted to us when we don't even know where our money's going? We don't even have a plan. We don't even have a strategy. We're not even doing the very basic thing to set ourselves up living below our means, to set ourselves up to be prosperous so that we can be generous and a blessing to the world around us. Why would God trust us with more when we're not even stewarding well what he's already given to us? Now, when I say budget, I know a lot of us here diet. Like, no, we're no longer going to be able to eat the things that we want to eat. It's like broccoli and cauliflower from here on out, boys. Get ready. Buckle up. <laughs> That's what, like, we're no longer going to be able to do what we, we want to do. But I, I just want us to know that that is not true. Or, or we see a, a budget as something that we need to do until we get to a certain point, like a, like a diet. Like, once I lose five pounds, then I'm kicking this diet. I'm out of here. I'm eating whatever I want again, right? And then you go back from diet to pounding, diets to, to gaining that weight back, diets to more pounds, diets to gaining that weight back, and it's a circle. How many know it's a lifestyle that we live? This is a lifestyle that God has called us to live, and a lot of us see a budget as being restrictive, but it's actually just the opposite. A budget brings freedom. A budget actually sets us up to do more of the things that we want to do in life. With $16,000 worth of credit card debt, you ain't doing what you want to do anyways. You're just buying time. Eventually, how many know? Eventually, you reap what you sow. You're sowing poor stewardship. Eventually, you're going to reap the, the consequences of that. Right? We're just buying more time. Are you with me, church? And so, we, so a budget is a lifestyle we live. I heard it said like this. A budget is not law. Is not law it's liberty. And living below our means and having a budget are keys to having our money work for us instead of us working for our money. When we work for our money, how many know that's driving with the emergency brake on? But when we get our money working for us, come on, I just took that bad boy off. Now that regal is floating down the road. Who knew it was this luxurious to be in a Buick Regal in 1996? I did, right? After I got the e-brake off. Same thing with our finances. When we get a budget, we start living below our means. Who knew I could have all this financial freedom? And maybe I can't give millions of dollars away, but I can buy that burrito for someone and say, Jesus loves you. I can be generous to the world around me. And maybe I can't do everything, but I can do something. And all of a sudden, God's entrusting me with more because I'm stewarding well what he's given me in the first place. So those are healthy rhythms of prosperity, having, having a godly perspective, seeing prosperity through the, through the eyes of generosity, valuing people over our possessions, Maybe one of the reasons we're, we're driving with the emergency break on when it comes to our finances is because we've been valuing possessions over people. We've got to get back to how God sees things and living below our means so that I can be a greater blessing to the world around me and have the financial freedom God intended me to have. So now let's switch gears. Let's go over the healthy rhythms of productivity. Now, when it comes to productivity, what, what I really want to do is I want to focus on our daily rhythms. Everybody say daily daily rhythms because what we do daily will determine how we live our lives. In fact, if you show me your daily routines, I will predict the direction that your life is headed. That if we don't have any daily routines, if we don't have a vision for our lives, if we don't have, have, have an idea, a strategy, or some structure, if there's not a target that we're aiming at or something that we're working towards on a daily basis, how many of us know our lives will start to become idle and unproductive? The people, it's, what's interesting is that studies show the people who are the most predictable when it comes to their day, those are the people who have the greatest freedom and joy in life. And so I just want to give us a couple healthy rhythms when it comes to productivity. The first one is this. I want to encourage all of us, including myself. Number one is to get into the rhythm of routine. Or maybe to readjust some of our daily routines. That might be a good one. Did you know that 92% of highly productive and successful people follow planned daily routines? You can almost predict what these highly successful, productive people are going to do every single day. And it helps them be more productive. Now, when I talk about productivity, it's not about doing more. Don't hear that. I'm talking about doing things in a more efficient manner. Studies have actually shown that having a daily routine and schedule establishes structure in our life, which leads to less stress, 
greater concentration, improved work-life balance, and more confidence about our progress and abilities to reach our personal goals. But on the other hand, studies have shown that not having a routine can contribute to, to feelings of being overwhelmed, procrastination, forgetfulness, and wasted time. And I like to say it like this, that the goals are good for setting a direction, but routines are best for reaching your destination. Let me say that again for the people in the way, way back. Goals are great for, are good for, for setting your direction, knowing where you want to go, but routines are best in helping us get there, to reach our destination. I don't know about you, I'm an amazing starter. I'm amazing. I can start any project, any any goal, any diet, bring it, any exercise, I got it. I'm better at starting things than you, but I'm not great at finishing things. Anybody besides me? I got, I mean, I can, I can write some goals down and you're like, wow, those are your goals? I'm like, yeah, those are my goals. And then if you follow up with me, hey, how are those goals going? What do you mean? I got new goals. <laughs> those goals were dumb. They didn't, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm doing this. Oh, these are amazing goals. You keep checking in with me. I got all amazing goals, but just never tend to reach those destinations. Anybody else? So we kind of talk about daily rhythms. I want to take a look at a part of the creation story to show us the power of the day. Let's take a look at it in Genesis chapter one, verses three through five. Verse three says this, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And then he separated the light from the darkness and he called the light day. And the day in the darkness, night, and evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. Well, here's what's significant about that. Did you know that uh, our day is the only measurement of time that God gave to us? God didn't give us hours. He didn't give us minutes. He didn't give us seconds. Those are things that we've created to help us manage the day, but God just gave us the day. The day is the building block for all of creation. It wasn't, in fact, it wasn't even until day four that God created the sun, moon, and stars to help us govern the day and mark seasons. In other words, what I would suggest to us is that God is showing us that one of the most important things when it comes to time and productivity is our day. Don't get me wrong, we can, we, can, we can get our week planned out, we can set monthly goals, come on, we can have yearly strategies, I think we should do all those things, I do those things, but if we don't get our day right, we're never going to excel in time management and productivity. There tend to be a bunch of goals, we have weekly goals, monthly goals, yearly goals, but we don't have any routines or strategies daily to help us get there. We're, we're never going to maximize our energy. We won't maximize our influence. We won't maximize our earning potential if we don't get our day right. You know, Christian our author, Mark Batterson, he wrote, he wrote a book that I'd highly recommend. It's called Win the Day. And one of my favorite chapters in this book is called Eat the Frog. Come on, that's a great chapter, isn't it? Eat the Frog. The frog, and it was based off of uh, this, the advice that Mark Twain once said. He said, if you have to eat two frogs, eat the bigger one first. So how many know some great advice? Eat the bigger one first. And his whole point in this advice was to get the hardest part of your day done first. Because if you do the hardest part, of the, uh, hardest part first, the rest of your day will be easy compared to that. I mean, if you eat the bigger frog first, that smaller frog won't be as difficult to eat. And so when it comes to our day, the most important part is the morning. How many of us know that what comes first always determines what comes next? What we do first, we tend to do the best. And so what we do first is super important. In fact, I would recommend uh, that one of the first things we do in our day is spend time with the Lord. Let me just start my day in God's presence, even if it's just 15 minutes. Let me spend five minutes in worship, five minutes reading God's word, and five minutes in prayer. This is a great way to start the day. Sometimes I can wake up, I'm a little droggy and all that. I'll put my AirPods in and I'll put on a worship song 
And sometimes I'll just sit in my lazy boy. Come on, worship is not me dancing around the house. It's me engaging my heart with heaven and honoring the name that's above every single name. I know worship's really your heart, heart posture and the lifestyle that we live. And so I can be sitting my lazy boy, my AirPods in, listening to worship music and just lifting my hands, having a moment with Jesus starting the day. I know that sets the tone for how my day is going to go. I mean, no, I can't control what happens to me, but I can control how I respond to it. And starting my day in God's presence helps me respond the right way to the situations I face that day. And then I get into God's word, even if I'm just reading one chapter that day. And then I pray. And if some of us might say, well, I don't even know what to pray for. Here's a great idea. Find the top for whatever the, the three most or five most people that you love that are in your life. And you go to them. Hey, what can I pray for? What do you need? What are you asking God to do in your life? And take a little journal. I promise you, that'll take you longer than five minutes to pray. You start praying for other people. I mean, you start your day praying for other people, then you start getting inspired. Like, wait a minute, I got an idea. I got this to pray for, and I got that to pray for. And before you know it, you're praying for a lot longer than five minutes, right? And I would suggest starting our day with at least 15 minutes, but if it can longer, the more time we can spend with God, the better. But I think what we will discover is this routine helps us, helps set us up to win the day. Start the day with the Lord, and then maybe, maybe you, you have to figure out your own routines. I'm not going to do that for you. Maybe it's physically. Maybe you're going to go to the gym. Maybe you're going to go for the walk. You're going to do something physically. Or maybe something that I'm starting to do or I'm, I'm trying to implement in my routines is, is to dream in the morning. A lot of times I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll spend some time with the Lord, and I'll go work out or whatever, and then I come into the office, and my day just starts. Right As soon as the kids wake up, come on, parents, all of a sudden they wake up and all Hades breaks loose in our home. Anybody else, right? The chaos starts, right? And so I just can't take a breath. It seems like the rest of the day I'm spinning plates. I'm putting out fires. I got this responsibility. I got that responsibility. And so what I'm trying to do is the first 30 minutes of my day after I spend time with the Lord is just dream. Have some more. Let me just dream today. What do I want my marriage to look like? How do I want to parent my kids? What needs? Let me just dream and, and have some vision and margin in my life to take a breath. God, what do you want for this year? What do you want for this week? What do you want for this day? And so those are some of the routines that I'm putting in place. But how many know we need to, to have some routines in our lives? We need to get in the rhythm of routine. The second healthy rhythm of productivity I want to encourage all of us to, to do is number two, and that is to build in a, re, a rhythm of rest. Everybody say rest. Let's just take a breath. How many know we need rest built into our schedules so we don't get burnt out? And here's the problem with burnout. You don't realize you're burned out until oftentimes it's too late. Too often we don't recognize we're on the verge of burnout until we need major help. Now, I just want to say it like this. The best thing that we can give to others, whether it's in our business our families, or our relationships, the best thing we can give to others is a rested and refreshed version of ourselves rather than an exhausted, burnout version of us. I don't know about you, I'm a better parent when I'm rested. I have more patience when I'm rested. I'm a better spouse, I'm a better leader when I'm rested and refreshed. And so you might be thinking to yourself, man, how, how do we even do it, Pastor? I'm so glad you asked. Because I got good news, just like my buddy had that day on the on the interstate, you've been driving with the emergency brake on. And God's already given us a rhythm of rest. He's already laid it out for us. How many of us know it's called the Sabbath? Which literally means to cease and to rest. God even modeled this in the creation story because in, in six days he created the world, but on the seventh day he what? He rested. He took a Sabbath. He ceased. And how many of us know if God rested, we probably need to rest too. In fact, if you have a hard time giving yourself permission to rest, just know God rested. You need to rest. Take a look. I want us to see this about the Sabbath, about resting. Mark chapter 2, verse 27. Jesus looking at them, looking at his disciples, is teaching us about the Sabbath. He says, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. This, this isn't a law. This isn't another religious thing for us to do. God created the Sabbath as a gift to give to us because he knows how much each and every one of us need to rest, to take a breath. He knows beyond even what we know how good it is for our souls when we rest. God knows better than we do of how limited we are. 
Sometimes, if you're like me, I think I can take on the world. But the truth is, I'm limited. The truth is, I can only do so much. I I love this in in, in the other version, ESY version. Mark chapter 2, verse 27 says, Then Jesus said to the Pharisees, same scripture, says, God wanted to help people, so he made a day for them when they should. Everybody say, should. should. Not an idea, not not, an idea. Consider it. You should rest. He did not make people so that they could keep laws about the day of rest. How many of us know we can get more done in six days when we're rested than seven days when we keep running? And so the question I want to ask all of us is, how do we rest? Like if there, if there was a day when we, we had no one, nobody needed us, oh, mom, dad, I, do you remember what that was like? I don't either. When nobody needed us, we had no responsibilities, nothing had to be done question is, what would we do? What would you do if you had a day when you had no responsibilities, nothing needed to be done, and nobody needed you? What would you do in that day? It's a great, I'd sleep. Yeah, it's good. What would you do? Because a lot of us, a lot of us struggle with even answering that question because we see rest as a luxury our schedules and responsibilities just won't allow. Oh, that'd be nice, Pastor, but that my, my responsibilities, my schedule, there's just no way. Can I just tell you, if that's your answer to that question, you need to rest more than anybody. You need the Sabbath more than any of us. If you see it as a luxury that your schedule and responsibilities won't allow. Others, others of us, when we think of rest, we, we think of a, a lot of us, here's the problem a lot of us run into, and that is we use rest, we think it's just an escape. Can I just remind us, True rest is restorative. Here's the difference. A lot of us, we think rest is an escape. This would be like this, binge uh, binge watching Netflix, scrolling through social media. Now there's nothing wrong with these things, right? Taking your kids to Disney World. I mean, that's fun, but you ain't coming back rested and restored. (laughs) You're coming back broke and exhausted. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Right? You are. And, and, and that's why I throw the, the Disney World in there with Netflix and scrolling on social media. Like, there's nothing wrong with, go, go to Disney World. Go make some memories and moments with your kids. That's beautiful. But just know that's an, you're kind of escaping. That's a, that's a vacation where you're not going to come back rested and restored. I mean, no, true rest is restorative, meaning this is what the Sabbath is all about. God says, binge watch Netflix. Cool. Scroll through social media. All right. Don't do it a lot because you'll get dumber. <laughs> Go to Disney World. Go do those things. But here's my point. If all you're resting is escaping and you're never entering into restoration, you're depleted and driving through life with the emergency brake on. No wonder. We just go to the next thing. I was talking to a girl in between work and or in in between um, services, which is work for me, just, you know. um, And she's like, I thought you, I just felt like you were talking to me because the other day I was tired and I had time to go take a nap. And so I went in to lay down, but I ended up just scrolling through social media for an hour. And then I got up and I wasn't more rested. I wasn't more refreshed. I was just as tired, if not more, before I even went to go take a nap. She's like, I should have went down. I go, yeah, I go, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But that nap would have restored you more than that social media would have, right? Are you with me, church? I mean, this is, this is even in, in our, so we can escape, but we need some restoration. So that's what the Sabbath is all about, that we would take a day and rest, that we would do some things that would restore our soul. And, 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 and so I just want to say, a Sabbath is not just an escape from the busyness of life. It's a rhythm that God has gifted. He's gifted us with that restores and refreshes our souls. And so let me just give us three things real quick, not in your notes. Uh, about the Sabbath. We just need to know. I could teach a whole series on this. Maybe we will later on in life. But the Sabbath is really all about trust. Everybody say trust. It's it's about trusting that we can rest a day and God will still provide. It kind of reminds me of tithing. That that I actually 90% of my finances that are blessed by God will actually go further than 100% that are not. It's actually about trusting God. I'm trusting God with a day. I'm trusting God that I'm still gonna be able to get that thing done. I can actually do more on six days when I'm rested than seven days when I'm running and God's faithful. And too often as followers of Jesus, we say we trust God, but we live our lives as though everything depends on us. 
So the, the Sabbath is about trust. The Sabbath is about increase. Farmers understand this. That they have to rest their fields. They have to rotate their crops so that they can actually produce more fruit. High-level athletes like myself understand this reality. What? You didn't know? No. But high-level athletes understand that they have to work hard, they have to eat well, and they have to rest. Or they won't grow and develop. And so the Sabbath is about trust, it's about increase, and finally the Sabbath is about resetting and restoring. Getting back to some things that we've gotten away from. How many of you could do that when you take a breath? When you're rested and refreshed? You can dream again. You can, you can see the big picture when you, when we're in the details and putting out fires and spinning plates and going from one thing, how many of we can't see the big picture? And so when I take a, a Sabbath and I rest, I'm resetting and I'm restoring and I'm getting back to some of the things I've gotten away from because when we're grinding day in and day out, how many of we lose ourselves? We lose our purpose, we lose our why, we lose our way. But when we walk in the rhythm of rest, we can get back to living our lives with purpose, meaning and having our identity in the thing and the one who actually satisfies our soul. His name is Jesus. And this is how we walk in a rhythm of productivity through rest and routine. And I'll close with this thought. Just was thinking about even this series that we've done, Healthy Rhythms. And really we're talking about habits and having a quality of life in this busy world, making sure that we're, we're going after the right things and we're putting our time, energy, and effort in think, into things that really matter, right? Isn't that what we've kind of talked about these, these past three weeks? And I just was thinking that the average person lives to be around 79 years old. That's 28,835 days on the earth. I don't know how many days that we have left. I turned 45 this year. I know you didn't, you didn't think so. You didn't say anything. Uh, but if you, do the, if you do the math, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less than 14,000 days left. If, I, if, I, if God would bless me to live to 79. And that starts to, okay, I got, how many days do I have left? 12,000 days left? I'm over half done? I don't know about you today. I don't know if we have 20,000 days left or two days left, but all of our days are numbered. And I want to encourage us to, to make the most out of every day. To make the most, the Bible says in Ephesians, out of every opportunity that God has given to us. And I just believe that today could be the day that would change the entire trajectory of our lives. And maybe there are several of us here today or maybe even watching on the lo- online. You might say, man, I, uh, I've lived most of my days the wrong way. But the Bible tells us that God makes all things new. That when we enter into a relationship with God, he gives us a fresh start, new beginnings. I don't know how many days I have left, but I want to make the most of my life. James tells us in uh, James chapter 4, verse 14, not in your notes, but it says, he says, life is a mist. It's a vapor. It's here one minute. It's gone the next. I mean, life is short. David prays this amazing prayer in Psalm 39, verse 4. David prayed, Lord, remind me how brief my life is. Remind me to live for what matters most. I just want to encourage us today. That's part of having some healthy rhythms. Emotionally, physically, financially, in our schedules, in our time. We slow down. We get back to the main things. The main things would get back to becoming the main things in our life. Amen. Would you pray with me today? Father, we love you. God, we thank you for how practical your word is, that the truth of your word speaks to the everyday moments of our lives. And as we're praying together, God, I pray that that you would speak, Lord, because we're listening. In fact, with every head bowed, every eye closed, would you just pray this prayer with me right where you're at? Say, God, how do you want me to respond to the message today? What's my next step? Because I don't want to just be a hearer of your word, I want to be a doer. Maybe some of us today, we've been driving with the emergency brake on when it comes to our finances. Maybe we've not seen our our, our finances and prosperity through the lens of generosity. God, help us to become more generous. Maybe others of us have been driving with the e-brake on because we've been valuing possessions over people. God, help us not get so focused on the possessions we want that we miss the people that are all around us. 
Help us to live below our means today. Maybe that's you. Maybe others of us, you've not been resting. You've been driving with the emergency brake on through your life because you have no routine and you don't rest. And right now, I pray, Holy Spirit, show us our next step. Maybe it's starting the day with the Lord, just getting into that routine. Maybe it's getting into the gym. Maybe it's getting some margin. Whatever it is, God, give us wisdom. Help us to rest. Help us to Sabbath. It's okay to escape, God, but help us to have some routines and some rest that's restorative, that our souls can be refreshed and we can give the best version of ourselves to the world around us. Maybe uh, some of us are here watching online and you would say the way you've lived your days up until this point, you've lived the wrong way. That you don't have a relationship with God. You know about him, but you've never entered into a relationship with him. And the Bible tells us that if we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, that he's the Savior, the Bible tells us that we shall and we will be saved. That God will give us a fresh start, a new beginning, a new life, where we're honoring him with our lives and following his plan and his purpose for our lives. Maybe that's you today. Maybe today is your day. Well, the Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. Or maybe you walked with God at one point in time, but it's time to put him first. He's not first anymore, but today he's first. If that's you, come on, would you lift your hand to heaven saying, God, you're first in my life. God, here's, here's my heart. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to know you. And right where you're at, maybe you're watching online, just pray this prayer with me. Say, God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to pay the price for my sin on the cross. God, thank you for loving me right where I'm at, but loving me enough not to let me stay there. Today, God, here's my heart that you've always wanted. God, forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Show me how to live. My life is yours. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, let's give God some praise because he's worthy. Let's